Hey, peace and blessings to you. My name is Jerry B. I am the Entre Musician and so are you. And so is our guest we have for today. I, I got to tell you, this is going to be one of those conversations where we're just going to kind of like sink into it and it's going to seem like you are just sitting in to uh, two old friends because the first way I'm going to introduce Russ is he is my new best friend about maybe eight or nine months ago since our first phone call. Uh, he has really been a dear soul to me and I appreciate him lending his expertise to so many things we're involved in, especially the entree musician. He's a great arranger, wonderful composer, incredible saxophonist, flautist, and we'll find out how many other hats he has to wear as an entree musician. This is Russ Palladino, my new best friend. Blessings to you, man. Thank you, Jerry B. Wonderful Hi. to be here. How you and, feeling? And uh, yes, you are my new best friend. That's what's <laughs> I up. I didn't you... realize we were we were uh, separated at birth. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you so we had that long conversation. Exactly. Well, you can't you can't get rid of me now, man. It's been like right on point. I really do appreciate <laughs> you. I don't know even where to begin. It seems like in the time that we've had that first phone call, we've talked about so much, but you've been involved in so much in music. You can just really take it away. When was the when was the first time that you realized you know, I'm really at home here. And why did you choose the saxophone? Well, I grew up in a musical household. My father is a saxophonist. He hasn't been playing in several years, but um, between uh, exposing me to so much great music and teaching me, you know, my initial making sounds on the saxophone to encouraging me throughout my life uh, that was my that was my first ins inspiration i wanted to be like my dad mm. and uh, then i wanted to be like john coltrane <laughs> oh but, well, did he expose you to coltrane you said he exposed you to so much great music what did what did you grow up listening to well my dad really loves jazz and uh, he's like a hard bopper and um you know, exposed me to all the, the great saxophonists, John Coltrane, Sonny Rollins, Cannonball Latterly. But um, he always loved all, all different kinds of music. So mm. um, he turned me on to the best of Sam and Dave. Oh, yeah. And Santana and Joe Cocker and just so much great stuff the beatles i mean my my first beatles record was his first was his beatles record uh the band chicago mm. i remember hearing from my youngest memories yeah. so uh it's always been around my house and, and my brother is also musical too he's a drummer is that right and you have a yeah. son you have a son who's musical he's a guitarist my, right my son is a excellent uh, songwriter and vocalist and guitarist. As a matter of fact, I was just doing horn section parts and solos for something that he's releasing, um, I guess maybe in a month or so. And uh, it was like, he let, he let good old dad put, put a few uh, blips and blops down there. <laughs> so you think he was just being cordial or <laughs> was he really honoring his dad? Were you Ah, uh, no, you know what? I mean, I'm his biggest fan. Yeah. I mean, he yeah. really is is so talented. And it turns out that uh, just based on what he tells me, he's my biggest fan, too. So we have a really beautiful thing where we share music and um, so, sometimes we make music together. But there's nothing we like better than being on a long car ride and just Dad, check this out. And he plays some stuff for me. Oh, yeah, well, how about this? Check this out. <laughs> and that's how you pass the tradition along. You know, right. um, you need people to show you what great music is. And I got to say, my son shows me some great music that I wouldn't have known either. So Wow. Well, tell me, what he, what is he into? What, what type of stuff is he turning you on that you really think? Man, that's fantastic. Well, his, um, his music is, I don't know if genres are weird because it's it's i guess pop punk but um he it's got influences with ska 
and it's got influences with Beatles oh, wow. and the band The Jellyfish and all kinds of different influences that he brings into it. But um, he is the one that really turned me on to hip hop because mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't really into hip hop, at, you know, in the 90s when it really started uh, exploding. And uh, I kind of didn't pay attention to it that much. I was into other things. I was into rock and jazz and R&B and stuff. And, um, and he really exposed me to some great classic stuff that I never would have uh, stumbled on by myself. Wow. So that's something cool that I've, I've discovered. And, and, and some of his bands, his pop punk bands and ska mm -hmm. bands and things that he loves. Mm -hmm. So it's cool. Cool give and take. I can dig that. Now, is there a particular uh, artist who has influenced you most, perhaps from your uh, formative years that you would say, wow, you know, dad turned me on. The house was, you know, full of all kinds of different genres. But, you know, for this group or this artist, you mentioned Coltrane, but, you know, in your formative years, were you really trying to say, this is the statement I want to make and it closely aligns with this artist or band? Well, as a saxophonist, I've I've been involved in a lot of different types of music, mm -hmm. and that's by design. Um, that's why I don't call myself a jazz musician because mm -hmm. I, I believe that you really have to live jazz if you want to, you know, be like a make a serious statement with, you know, bebop and and uh, you know traditional straight ahead jazz. And um, I love to play it and I love to practice it, but I mean, I love funk, I love rock. I mean, you know, Tower of Power and yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Earth, Wind and Fire and uh, uh, I, you know, uh, the Rolling Stones. I love the Rolling Stones. And from time to time I sub in a Rolling Stones tribute band and love it. So it's kind of hard to say. I mean, I, I modeled myself in my early years, like I, I loved to uh, play along to anything that John Coltrane was was a part of. Yeah. Whether it was with Miles Davis or playing along to my favorite things. Yeah. Um, but um, as I as I uh, you know started playing more seriously, Michael Brecker made mm. a deep impact on me and. Yeah, yeah. He's like my living hero and yeah. being able to have seen him a couple of times and, you know, life changing experiences uh, that just incredible, you know, fellow so, New Yorkers. Uh, I would say too, for right? saxophone, those are my, t my two main influences. Well, Brecker, I mean, golly, hands down, you know, our, our 20th century, I think, Coltrane. I don't I don't want to disrespect anyone, but that's my personal opinion. Um, Pilgrimage was a great CD of his and Wide Angles. Are you into Wide Angle CD? I mean, oh, come yeah. on. Well, that arrangement is just like, are you kidding me? The whole <laughs> CD is tough for me to put it in and then pull it out. It, it begs repeated listenings because you're already always learning something, you know, with each phrase. Wonderful well, stuff. Well, I think the thing that's in, that they share in common, which really, I guess, made an impression on me was you could listen to John Coltrane in 1956 or 58, and then in 1960 and 1964, and there's much, you know, different in the in the approach and and uh uh statements that he was making he sounds you know like himself but different mm -hmm. and um same thing with michael brecker um I, you know uh first thing i heard michael brecker playing was fusion and then i realized that he was you know the soloist on so many incredible uh pop albums and then you know his jazz just you know, yeah. blew me away. And so yeah. him too, there was a, a progression and, you know, wanting to speak his voice, no matter what music he was in, but also playing appropriately for whatever music it was. Yeah. You know, if it was, uh, he was playing on, uh, you know, a rock and roll thing, 
like uh, Dire Straits, he wasn't playing bebop. He was right. playing what was appropriate to that music. Right. So that is kind of how I tried to model myself. Yeah. And, you know, lo loving all these different kinds of music, um, you know, I try to always play appropriately for whatever I'm doing. Yeah, you, you, you're right about the chameleon approach. You know, early on, uh, my first exposure to uh, Michael Brecker and his brother Randy, were they were a part of Parliament Funkadelic. You know what I mean? So, you know, those, those horn hits that are so, you know, uh, there are staples in a lot of the early P-Funk stuff of the 70s is the Breckers. And they've hooked up with Fred Wesley and Maceo Parker, and they just put this power section together and it bowls you over. So Michael, yeah, he was he was a chameleon. That's for sure. They did the average white band stuff, too. Oh, Blitter. I didn't know that. Really? Not not the solo on Pick Up the Pieces, but uh, they played, uh, you know, the section parts in, in so many of the average white band albums. Are we, you know, we were talking about this in our last conversation. I, I guess this would be a good segue into it because, you know, again, when you talk about average white band, Parliament Funkadelic, Tower of Power, Earth, Wind & Fire, and we can go on and on and on. It seems like the music of that day, um, dating myself here, but the 70s, uh, you know, we, we had this whirlwind of different bands that were all dynamic power guys. And then today, as I don't want to sound like a grumpy old man, Russ, but today somebody will say, hey, put this on, man. This is this is the stuff right here. You really need to. And I don't know. <laughs> I'm thinking. Derry, I, I'm sorry. I got to go. I don't hang out with grumpy old men. So I'm, I'm out of here. Sir. <laughs> no, I'm a grumpy old man, too. I'm a grumpy old man, too. Man. Oh, I thank man. my lucky stars that I became aware of music in the you know i guess late 60s and you know the 70s that's my that's my jam right that's there me, i mean yeah, you know yeah and um what i loved about about that era and i guess into the 80s and and into the 90s but um you know not so much uh in in the 2000s or, mm -hmm. or really the recent 2000s sure there was this there was this embracing of um, being unique, be, you know, having your own voice, having your own band sound, yeah, having yeah. your own uh, perspective. And that's how you differentiated yourself. And, um, you know, really that's, that's how an artist defined their thing. Yeah. Um, nowadays, you know, you can click down through the charts and, you know, you hear a lot of interesting things, sounds and whatnot, but, I mean, so much of the same, yeah. <laughs> you know, just a lot of the same. Uh, it's it's become much more formulaic, you know. Yeah, it's too that's stale. that's the part that I don't get with, you know. It, it's too it's too stale for me. It, you know, same chord changes. You know, no exploration. The emotion, I think, too. You know, I mean, if if you listen to. Uh, James Brown, you know, screaming, <laughs> screaming in the microphone or, you know, the Dales or, you, you know, you, you were mentioning in our last conversation about Al Green. And I'm going to ask you about that because I know you're working on an Al Green project, but I'm talking about soul and sweat and heart and emotion. I think it's really being phoned in. I, I love the technology. I do. I, I love what technology does. But I think we are relying too much on our DAWs and not in our spirit. Yeah. You know what? I mean, technology, it's, it's a funny thing. Like, I absolutely love that I have technology that enables me to literally, you know, uh, employ any sound I can imagine. You know, I, I have symphony orchestras. I have you know, all kinds of percussion and, uh, you know, uh, horns and instruments. But, you know, it depends on how you choose to use this stuff. I mean, um, uh, Stevie Wonder uh, um, was one of the early people that uh, used synthesizers and would, you know, create an entire album himself with synthesizers. Yeah. But he was playing them, and yeah. there was so much life yeah. to what he yeah. was doing. Exactly. And exactly. Um, exactly. 
yeah. now you know there's a lot of cut and paste going on yeah. because um there's samples and loops and um you know all kinds of uh sounds that are just made available that you can just drop into your door yeah. and you know and and work from that um when i work i mean I, i'm not going to say i never use anything like that but sure, i like to sure. try and find sounds and play them you know perform them uh yes. rather than just find things that have already been invented yeah yeah speaking of which um i was going to ask you do you prefer uh recording in this season of your life over touring or are you still out there with your suitcase <laughs> <laughs> well i'm mostly touring the tri-state area these days uh -huh. but uh <laughs> that's about as far as i want to go because i'm 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 pretty much a homebody and uh you know, there was a time that I really wanted to be out and about and, and roaming the world. But I tell you the truth, I, I really enjoy being home, being able to work from my, my own space uh, and collaborate with people from around the world. Um, yeah. I, I'm really loving composing in, in, at this stage of my life mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, I feel like I, I'm, I'm doing my best now because of all the listening i've done throughout my life and all of the people that i've played with and different things like that so yeah. uh you know composing is is really where it's at for me and i've been working on trying to build a uh, composer catalog for sync licensing and you know get a little bit more organized and serious about my composing wow now, uh, let's go into the fact that uh, you're using your technology to reach out around the world and you are collaborating with a young brother in, in England, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And yeah. Tell, tell um, us there's about a, that a guy that I met uh, by the name of Carlos Fandango. That's his artist name. Mm -hmm. um, we met, uh, you know, in a, in a social forum, but then we started talking about music. So I went and I checked out his music and... Um, was completely blown away because he was making music that sounded like, uh, you know, the Beatles and Pink Floyd and, but in their, in their greatest time. Yeah. And he was applying that ethic to new music that he was writing. Mm. So, you know, we got talking about, uh, similar to you and I, how, you know, all the different people that we grew up listening to and loving and absorbing. Yeah. And he's the same way. So we decided to uh, collaborate on some things, and we did a uh, a song that started as an instrumental uh, piece of mine, and it just happened to have been titled "Mother's Love." And he um, uh, took it and and took it to another place with lyrics and vocals and uh, harmonies and everything. And so then we started talking about some of the music that we really love and and like you know if we had our druthers and uh you know i said i always wanted to have like a soul band like sam and dave and wilson pickett and yeah. al green and he was yeah. like oh al green so i said you would want to do an al green style song and he was like yes yes definitely so um i said you know what i have something that i think would work for that and i kind of like went back and just absorbed as much Al Green as I could for a week and just reminding myself. And what was cool about it is I realized that um, there was limits, you know? You have guitar, bass, drums, organ or electric piano, yeah, yeah. Uh, strings, and a horn section. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's it. No sense, no, you know, uh, no, nothing crazy going on. And, you know, how do you write for that and capture that spirit? So I'm really excited. We're not quite finished yet, but we're, we're, we're getting there. And I'm hoping that people hear it and say, oh, wow, man, that, that would have been a great song for Al Green to, to do, you know? Now, is this a, an entire project or is this just an EP or, uh, you know, a um, single or? You haven't decided right now yet. it's just it's just one one tune so um okay. we're talking about doing maybe a whole you know tribute to 
Soul, uh, you know, the uh, Stax Atlantic, oh, yeah. uh, Muscle, Muscle Shoals oh, yeah, Sound, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, James Brown, and, you know, just, yeah. you know, because it's, it's such a, a, a great music and uh, it, it takes in, into account a lot of things that we have listened to and love. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's kind of like a labor of love. Well, that's beautiful. That that is excellent. Now, uh, Muscle Shoals. Just to throw this in, did you see that documentary? I did. Oh my god! I did. Oh my god! I mean, come on. So <laughs> I, I highly recommend you if you're an entre musician of any caliber at all. That's a place that you want to uh, begin again. As far as having that story, having the experience of adventure. Because at the beginning, these guys didn't know what they were doing. And after Wilson Pickett, they didn't know what they were doing. But let's keep doing this. And that drew <laughs> the ire of everyone around the world. You know, this is the place right. we have to come. It's beautiful. Yeah. And you know what? It was about making a sound. Yeah. And, you know, like, that was a unique sound. The, um, you know, the stacks thing that was coming out of Chicago was a sound. Yeah. Um, you know, you had like a Florida sound, you had a New York City sound with the Brill building and yeah. and all of that. So you know, you could open your computer now and get any sound you want. Sure. But there's something about the mystique of bringing selecting the right group of people sure. and putting them together. That's why the, the Rolling Stones, you know, they always sounded like the Rolling Stones. Correct. When, when you put those guys in the room, you know, they, that was their sound. And that's correct. I think that's something of a lost art because, like I said, uh, you know, you flip through today's pop charts and yeah. everything sounds the same. Well, there was a time, too, when, you know, I mean, we entered this has to be 91, 92, when we really entered into the age of the producer you know, where it was the band and the producer pretty much ran the recording session and let the artist be him or herself. And then we got into the superstar producer era where all of the songs were written by the producer, right? And he or she used their crew of people. And so there was no salad. There was no eclectic taste. There was no, you know, uh, bridging and experimentation because here's the sound, this is what you sing. This is how you sing it. And the artist kind of fell by the wayside. I wouldn't say I wouldn't I wouldn't say that, uh, you know, completely, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in the beginnings of that that uh, era mm -hmm. with, um, you know, Quincy Jones. Oh, Quincy, no, no, Quincy no. Jones no, brought out no. The best let me and, let, let me clarify. You got Quincy. You got Arif Martin. You know, you, you, you have people who are really uh, supporting the artist early on, early on, early on. But 91, 92, 93, it became. And I don't want to say any names, but, you know, go back and. and do yeah, yeah. And that, it was yeah. their well, sound, you know. Nowadays, I mean, the, um, most of the pop music is done by committee. And, <laughs> you know, a lot of it. <laughs> The tracks are produced somewhere in Sweden by this group of, <laughs> you know, four dudes or something like that that, right, uh, right. that create everything. And so that's why it all sounds the same. And, um, <laughs> you know, you have like eight writers on a, on a song, you know. But, I don't oh know. my God, Maybe wait a minute. Sat down at the piano. Wait a minute. He, he... Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, you know, you, you're pushing buttons here, though. Right, but eight. <laughs> Yeah, eight writers on a song, but the lyrics are what? Right. I'm sorry. Right. right? I mean, right. I, I, gosh, I don't want to be a Jerry Downer at all. I'm just saying I've seen it. There are some uh, records that have 11 writers on it. You know, you do a word count. There may be 32 words in the whole thing. No <laughs> depth. Most of those 32 words are repetitions of each other. I'm just saying, some it's, something's been it's, lost. Um, I think it's more of like a uh, a factory approach, I guess you, you would call it, you know? I mean, you know, people have always collaborated. I mean, Lennon, right. McCartney, you know, I, but um, it seems more corporate now. And I yeah. think that's, that's, you know, what you hear with a lot of the pop music. Now, this said, 
there is a lot of really interesting music, mm -hmm. excellent music, mm -hmm. you know, different kinds of young, young uh, people making uh, cool music. There's a whole, you know, funk resurgence with sure. people like, you know, Wolfpack and uh, Snarky Puppy yeah, and things like yeah. that. And, uh, you know, in terms of pop, I, I, I don't know if she would be considered um, country, but Brandy Carlisle is yeah. an amazing artist. She, she is, writes incredible she is, lyrics. Right. Uh, is a great musician. Plays yeah. with a great band and yeah. sort of does it old school. Yeah, Bruno Mars is, uh, you know, I think Bruno he's Mars. making a strike. You know, uh, Kendrick Lamar. I mean, you know, I, I, I don't want to discount again. You know, you don't want to say, oh, let's turn this episode off because all they're doing is complaining no there's there's good stuff out there but by and large you have to look for it it's not well here, coming here's the thing that i i think um is is being missed because mm -hmm. of the corporate attitude or whatever that's that's shaping how music is made there's something like i don't know forty thousand unique individual releases on like spotify and apple itunes and all those services uh per day per, per day, day. Yeah. <laughs> so you know just like it it makes sense that to be different to have a unique sound and a unique approach would probably help you get noticed easier than being able to um you know, being able to recreate everything that's going on in in the uh, in the in the pop environment, but yeah. I don't I don't see it happening yet. I still see, uh, you know, I mean, it's always been like that, chasing, chasing. You know, you get into a, a band years ago, and you know what's what's happening. Well, maybe we should shape our sound a little bit more like this. Of course, I'd be lying if I wasn't part of that. Sure, you know, mentality sure. also, sure. but you know. That's something that I think is sorely missing right now with the volume of everything going down yeah. in the music industry, you know, yeah. just but, to get noticed. But say, you know, you, you know, like you said, chasing, say you have, OK, well, this is what you really need to if you're going to be a good doo wop artist and you needed to have these harmonies and you needed to have that sound. But, you know, uh, they, were, they still stood on their own terms, even though that genre was the same. But it wasn't, to me at least, and correct me if I'm wrong, it wasn't so cookie cutter. We're going to be, you know, stylized like so-and-so, but, you know, hey, this is who we are. And you look at the moments, you look at the shy lights, you look at, again, the bells, you look at the four tops, you look at the temptations, you look at, okay, this is what a quintet sounds like, but you could blindfold yourself and pick them out and go, yeah, I know who that is because right. they still retain their own sound, their right. originality. Right. You know. Well, yeah. I mean, um, maybe part of the reason why music, I think, you know, the, the data uh, proves this, that it's much less significant in the lives of young people today mm. than it was for us where you know you you had a paper route and you saved some money so that you could get to the record store and right. and get that record that you wanted to get and you, you brought it home and you you ripped it open and you, you put it on and uh you sat there and you stared at the cover and read liner notes if yes. they were there and you know it was a, i it don't know it was like you took ownership of that music you know now, and now music ask, is kind of disposable. I let, let me no, you hit you hit it on the head. I was going to ask you because of that. Do you think because uh, this generation has been taught uh, that music is free, that it doesn't have the value that it once had? I would say certainly that that is is a definite uh, factor. You know, um, people don't want to own it. People don't want to take possession of it anymore. Uh, like like when. You know, we were proud to open our cabinet and show off our records or uh, <laughs> could have yeah. been eight track tapes. I had yeah. a box of eight track tapes <laughs> right, that I, right. I opened up back in the day. <laughs> but, um, you know, there's, there's something great about, you know, 
being able to say, uh, Alexa, I want to hear this, and it yeah. starts playing. But, um, you know, th th that real connection yeah. to the artist and the connection to the, to the music, making it your own. Exactly. I, I mean, I could be naive. I, maybe I'm just an old dude, like, you know, <laughs> hearkening back to the day. But I, I think that there was something more in terms of a connection I back guess. in our day. No, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. It was so tactile, you know. I remember uh, getting, a, I think it was Southern Southern Comfort or Southern Southern Nights by the uh, Crusaders, the Four Crusaders, and sitting there and really- I just listened to that album did the you? other day. Are you serious? I did. Oh my I God. I swear to God. I, I mean, you're sitting there and, you know, so you have the album cover in your hand and, you know, you're looking, all you have is a picture, you don't have YouTube. So you're looking at Joe Sample and you're imagining what's going on as he's laying down this great part. Or Wilton Felder. Uh, the album, uh, We All Have a Star by Wilton Felder is one of those that, again, begs repeated listening. He began to incorporate a lot of vocals in his stuff for the first time. And it's just like, my God, you're sitting there and you're holding it. I mean, that was the connection, like, and you're reading the liner notes over and over again. There was something. What about lyrics? You know, I mean, craziness, uh, uh, right? An album of that, like, really, like, hit me hard. Um, that I listened to, I wore it out. Was Bill Withers live at Carnegie Hall? And Who? Bill Withers open that gate. Bill, Bill Withers live at Carnegie Hall. Like it's in the top three of my Desert Island discs, you know. And yeah. um, it had this big gatefold jacket, and I would open it up, and I would look at the pictures of, of all the players. But reading lyrics yeah. along with, with the song was a, was a thing, too, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we drifted off into two old guys who are so nostalgic. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. it, it is yeah. it is what it is. And, you know, I mean, I think I think uh, this will be a great segue into talking about the fact that, you know, you can if you are out there, you absolutely can bring in that culture again. I don't think we have to say that was days gone by and it'll never return because you have men and women of a certain age who remember and who are musicians, but some of them don't think that, you know, they're either their music matters or what they went through and their experiences in the 70s and in the 80s matters, but it absolutely does. Would you agree with that? I would definitely agree with that. And here's something that I know for sure, because I do play live music in front of people all the time. And there is a culture of people, maybe it's, you know, 35 and older, uh, or maybe it's 50 and old, over, but um, there's people that absolutely love live music, mm -hmm. love the experience of sitting and listening to a band or a performer or whatever. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's, that's millions and millions of people still. So I think there's an audience there for, uh, you know, even, you know, older music makers like, like myself, I'm 58 years old. Absolutely. So, you know, yeah. I, yeah, I, I live that, that generation. And, and sometimes you get to this place and you say, well, I don't know. Am I still, is it still relevant for me to make music or, but I, I definitely think it is because I, I feel like I have a lot to say. And also, I mean, I'm br trying to bring the sum total of all of this stuff that I listened to my whole life and be true to that, have it come out yeah. instead of just, you know, limiting myself to this one, you know, rigorous little style or something, you know? Yeah. Well, I think, I think we've stepped into something as an entree musician. I, I should bring it up to those of you who are listening or watching that uh, Russ uh, is a part of our entree musician mastermind group. And, uh, you know, there will be times where you will turn on this podcast and you will hear just him uh, giving, you know, advice and instruction and, uh, you know, sharing his experiences uh, for you. But something that we've started 
as an entree musician community is called the Thrive Journey. And it's specifically for artists who are 50 years old and over. We didn't want to, you know, if you're 49 and a half, we'll still welcome you, of course. But, you know, it is for encouragement and for enlightening, sharing resources and just having community together so we can say, hey, you know, this is how we can help collaborate. It might not be with a song per se, but collaborate in your experience of getting your music out, helping you to understand technology and all of these new platforms so that you know that your artistry is relevant. Am I, am I leaving anything out? Um, well, yeah. just, just that the thing that drew me to you initially was um, you were speaking about mindset and um, dealing with self-doubt, dealing with, you know, imposter syndrome. Yeah. And, you know, even at this stage of my career and my life where I've, I've been making music literally since I'm 15 years old, so that's 40, I don't know, something years. Something in there, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, you, you, have, you have something to offer, but quite often... Um, society, our culture tells us that uh, if you're older, you're not relevant. Correct. But I think that that's a mindset that you choose to believe or not. Right. If you choose not to believe it um, and not be a victim of that, then you will free yourself to be creative. And then really what you need to do is, you know, if you want people to hear your music, we are in the uh, golden age of, you know, democracy for, you know, being able to be heard. Right. The problem is, how do you get noticed and using the tools that are available today? And I think, you know, people, you know, 50 and over um, might sometimes be challenged with the technology. Sure. And yeah. understanding how social media works for artists mm -hmm. these days and... Um, Exactly. You know, everything has changed. Uh, copyright has changed. Right. Um, the way your music is utilized and the places where it's utilized has changed. I mean, now all my focus is, uh, um, you know, how can I get my music placed in TV and movies and ads and things like that? But there was a time where the only thing I cared about was getting on the radio. <laughs> remember that exactly. thing? <laughs> the radio? <laughs> you remember hearing your uh, music for the first time on the radio, even if it was just in your locale, it was like heaven, right? Oh, I did. I did. The, the first thing that I ever heard on the radio was it was local radio. And I think I was maybe like about 14 years old and I played on a song called Elvis was a Capricorn, ah. <laughs> but it was like a soul tune. And it was by this this guy that sounded like Ray Charles. Oh wow! Go figure. But I don't know. I might have the record somewhere. I gotta look for that. As a yeah, fact. let me know. Let me let me hear. But that. yeah, that first time of like, oh wow, you know, it was like you 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 had arrived somewhere that was only like this mysterious place. You know exactly, exactly. But so, I mean, you can you can uh, create music. Put it uh, on the internet, put it on YouTube, uh, and be seen by millions of people, be heard by millions of people. Yeah. You just need to know how to access it. And I'm so happy to be a part of something that, you know, speaks to people like our age group or, right. or near our age group that are talented people, artists that have something to say and contribute and want people that enjoy that music to hear it exactly know that there's a way and you can and you can thrive i mean you can really build your own community your own fan base is it, not you know gone it really isn't and and but nobody knows that because they don't the culture has said sit down grandpa you know that was nice yeah i, I like what you did back then you know, but let me tell you this story, man. I, you know, I've said this before and I may have uh, made an illustration in another podcast, but this is a true story with no exaggeration whatsoever. And it's, it's one of the things that propelled us to really push the entree musician to a place where it is. And it happened because we were in a recording studio with this young, young man. He was 
maybe 22, 23, great vocalist. And we're, we're dropping tracks with him. And in the midst of recording during the course of that week, his father passes away. And so the engineer and I, we said, well, you know, we're going to obviously go and pay our respects, go to the calling hours. And uh, for this gentleman, you know, um, we didn't know him personally, the dad. So when we walk in, it's like at a community center and they have really nice uh, music playing in the background. It was just, you know, very personable. And and uh, it wasn't like your uh, regular receiving line. Everybody was kind of milling about, so to speak. But when I went up to the young man to, you know, just express our condolences and whatnot, and I just mentioned like, wow, you know, that's some great music playing. And he said, yeah, it was my dad's music. He said, you know, he, he never put it out. It was his hobby. He did it after work and he never thought he was good enough. And that thing like hit me hard. I didn't know this gentleman, mm -hmm. never met him. But just to think and just to have the mindset that his time had passed, it wasn't good enough. And here it is. And only these few hundred people in the room would only know it if they asked because the family didn't announce it. It was just playing in the background. God, please don't let that be my epitaph, that everything mm -hmm. that I, I have on my hard drive is is released and out. Somebody hears it prior to me leaving the planet. And that's just, you know, that was a push. It was a motivational push for me. So, Well, you know what? I mean, it says a lot about the kind of person that you are. Yeah. Um, you know, you minister to people and uh, yeah. you've, instead of just being self-centered about that, uh, you know, you described it as you want people to hear your music, but you really took this on to help pe help everybody get their music heard yeah. if they want. And, they um, uh, you know, the things that you do address in terms of like, um, uh, not, not spirituality necessarily, but, uh, you know, your, your internal spirit and drive, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, how to defeat that imposter syndrome, how to um, feel self-worth. I mean, these, these are important before anything happens. You know, that, sure. that's the thing that gets you to, you know, turn on the switch to the keyboard and, and sit down and start writing. Exactly. So um, that part of, of the Entree Musician and uh, all of the resources that are available is yeah. really important. It, it is to me. It's helped me personally. So if I can contribute anything and, and help any people, uh, you know, find that place in themselves, too, um, I'm more than happy to do it. As a matter of fact, I enjoy um, uh, every summer going to Victor Wooten's Center for Music and Nature and teaching um, something that we call uh, Inside Outside Saxophone Retreat. Mm. And we uh, deal with uh, less than, uh, instead of just dealing with notes on a page yeah. and, you know, uh, theory and stuff like that, we talk about, you know, really being connected to the music and how being connected to nature is important and, uh, you know, doing things to uh, uh, stimulate your senses in ways that you wouldn't have thought of. And I tell you, it's been just so gratifying mm. to work with some of the uh, players who are, you know, older players who maybe, you know, couldn't play for many years and they came back to it. And now they, they're not sure if they even, uh, you know, should be bothering with this or whatever. And finding that thing in themselves yeah, that maybe, yeah. maybe it's like the way back to that connection of when you first made sound and you were like wow yeah man this is so great yeah. before you started thinking about the business and what i got to do and the gigs and the money and the lawyers and the yes. whatever you know <laughs> that getting back to that spark the root yes. you know and i think if you can do that then it doesn't matter if anybody hears your music if you mm. enjoy creating and 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 uh, letting that part of yourself live, yeah. Instead of putting it in a box. No, I, I agree. You're absolutely right um, with respect to that. You know, there is that personal 
gratification that comes because we are spiritual beings and we're we're really expressing the gifts that God gave us to manifest, you know, musically and sound and frequency and whatnot. And then there is that, you know, business part of it, which makes us entree musicians. And you, I was going to say something prior to uh, getting into that story about you because you're not just really, you're not just a really great musician, which you are. I mean that. But you are an astute businessman too. You are like the ultimate entree musician because graphic arts and manufacturing and all of those things have been a part of your wheelhouse, uh, which have turned you into having a much broader approach than, hey, this is the type of read I play. You know what I mean? <laughs> you you, you want to talk a little bit about that that experience in your life? Sure, sure. Um, you know, there was a, a of course, uh, you know, plenty of time in my life when I was just a, you know, full time musician. But, uh, you know, children come into the picture and mortgages and things like that. And, yeah. you know, you you want a little bit more security and comfort. So, I mean, everybody does some other things. I am friends with some of the greatest musicians uh, in the world on their instruments. Uh, you know, thank God, um, yeah. you know, I can say that I know people like Victor Wooten and a yeah. uh, uh, very good friend of mine, Bob Franceschini plays with, with Victor and the Yellow Jackets and all these different, whatever. Oh, yeah. oh. Um, I lost what I was going to say. <laughs> well, you know, with respect to getting into graphic arts, uh, you've done some oh, okay. uh, interesting yes, yes, yes. album covers, right? <laughs> right, right. Men of, so men of a certain of age, we understand these things, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all of them, all of them uh, do other things mm -hmm. or, or do a variety of things, whether it's teaching, um, you know, whether it's some other, you know, business related types of things like you know um victor wooten writes books yeah. and uh you know that's that's a very important part of his thing you know so for me um at one point i decided that um it might be a good idea strategically to understand about manufacturing and uh it was at a time when the indie thing was just starting to take hold where you could actually do you know, produce your own records and right, right. sell them on your own. Uh, that was unheard of at one time. But um, so I, I started working in that field. And uh, eventually, I had my own business. And along the way, I realized that I needed to learn how to help with graphic art. And before you know it, I, I was doing graphics and um, learned about uh, web design and, and things like that along the way. So <clears throat> it's all part of, you know, my picture and the things that I do. So I do gigging, composing, uh, um, recording sessions for people. Writing and, charts? Uh, you write charts for people? Uh, mostly I play charts uh -huh. <laughs> these days, but, uh, uh, you know, if, if I'm, if I'm doing something, somebody sends me a track and I'll, I'll, uh, arrange something mm -hmm. and, and record all the parts at home myself. Yeah. But, um, I, I'm also able to handle, um, you know, disc manufacturing if people still want it, uh, it's, it's not what it used to be, mm -hmm. but, um, uh, you know, graphics and web design. If nothing else, it's helped me um, uh, feed my family yeah. and uh, also to understand computers and the technology so that <laughs> I'm the guy that all my friends come to when something needs to be done that's <laughs> got to be done on the computer. So, and, uh, you know, I, I, feel, I feel fortunate to have that aptitude because um, it's so important if you want to continue to make music. Correct. A answer a question for me, and you know that we can we can talk all day, and I know you don't have all day, um, so this is gonna be episode one of, of quite a few where we'll get together, but, but tell me, really, not from the grumpy old man standpoint, which we've already done that section, but streaming, streaming, as being a disc manufacturer, having that tactile experience, um, 
not only streaming in the in the uh, sense that you really don't own the music, you may rent it for the nine ninety nine a month or whatever, but uh, how does how does really streaming impact the artist? I've I've had so many different opinions from artists about this, but I, I'm eager to know yours. The impact of well, streaming on the artist. I I think that um, the ability to release something and get some instant gratification is kind of a good thing. Um, the, the issue really is it just doesn't seem to generate enough income for, uh, uh, you know, a, a performer or a composer to make a living. So, um, it, it holds a lot of promise, but I don't think that it's been figured out correctly yet to be able to sustain the industry and sustain artists. Now, I hear talk about, uh, you know, artificial intelligence creating music and things like this now. I mean, maybe the, the business types are deciding, well, who needs these people anyway? We'll, make, we'll just have the computer make the music. Interesting. But I don't think that you, you replace that human element. I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. I never thought the CD would go out of <laughs> out of fashion. I thought, wow, listen to this, you know, fidelity and, and uh, you know, uh, yeah. something that I, I could I could scratch and it would still play, right. you know, things like that. But um, yeah, I mean, streaming streaming offers a lot of uh, uh, ability to be heard, and um, the immediacy of hearing anything you want to hear when you want to hear it. Yeah. However. Uh, you lose some of the value of curation yeah. where, um, you know, say like the record industry and radio was sort of like weeding out, like just because there's 40,000 things released per day doesn't mean that there's 40,000 great pieces of art released every day. Correct. So there's, there's a filter factor that's kind of missing with that. Yeah. And just overwhelming the system of like, I don't know if you ever experienced this, but some days I'm like, okay, I want to hear some music and I'll open up iTunes and I'm looking and I'm, I'm flipping and I'm, well, what do I want to listen to? There's so much available. You know, I kind of miss the radio experience where I'm going to be surprised by what's next, uh -huh. you know? Correct. Correct. So, you know, there's there's good and bad in, in, in all of this, and I just don't think that we've figured it out yet. So, uh, from from a from an artistic standpoint, uh, or let's just let's just go deeper, entree musician standpoint. I, I think that we should, as musicians, as artists, as composers, be a little more proactive. I think the data is out. It's been a good seven years whereby the data is out that the royalty payment structure is severely stacked against us. So what do we do? Because I, I think now the new culture is, uh, and I, I again, I'm not trying to condemn anyone or anything. If you're a business person, you need to know the metrics and, and be profitable. But from the aspect of being a musician, a creative, a composer, a content creator, there should be fair and equal payment for your work, right? And I think that the entree musician should be a little more, uh, take a little more initiative in what that means. And so I would like to have a conversation. We won't do it in this episode, but just to wet the whistle, we should come up with a conversation as to how we can uh, take the initiative and say, okay, well, these are the the new rules. These are the new um, rules that we're going to create and play by so that we can, um, I don't want to say be treated fairly. That sounds such, you know, it's like such victim mentality. But what I'm saying is you, Russ, make wonderful music and it costs you to mix it and master it and bring it to bear 
And to only get 0. 0.0007 per stream, I think time's right. up. Right. Well, you know what? Um, I think that that it was always true that there's no guarantee that just because you made something that you're going to, I agree. you know, I agree. Be, be, uh, I agree. You know, uh, have appeal and and sell a lot of things and make a lot of money. I agree. I think we kind of, you know, th that era of the '70s that we're talking about that we love, kind of warped and distorted a lot of that and set up the yeah. parameter for what what was coming later. Because I truly believe that um, the CD led to this. Maybe oh, like a reaction oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, with with streaming. Yeah. Um, when people were were putting, you know, uh, instead of a forty minute record or a thirty minute record, now you got seventy, uh, almost eighty minutes, seventy nine minutes of yeah. music, and people were being charged, you know, twenty dollars for a CD or, or or more, and realizing that there might be one or two good songs and maybe a, a hell of a lot of filler there, but yeah. you know. More than that. <laughs> yeah, the one, yeah. The one radio single, and then who is this band? <laughs> you know? right. right, I mean, it, it just, uh, it became like a commodity. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I think that the public probably, you know, saw a lot of the excess of, you know, the biggest stars who, are still profiting. I mean, sure, you know, Bruce sure. Springsteen just sure. sold his his catalog for like five hundred million dollars right. or something like that. Right. Uh, Justin Timberlake for a billion order. So the biggest stars are still, you know, profiting. But that's that's a tiny, tiny sure. bit of sure. of the industry. Sure. So, you know, uh, I think that creativity has to come into the picture. Just like anything else, uh, that um, there's creative ways that people can think about exposing their music, bringing their music to people, whether it's you know streaming or whether it's you know live performance and building uh, an audience there. I still believe that that building of an audience is something that's doable. So I it's agree. something that's doable for people. But you have to be a little creative and you have to want to do the work. And that is another part of it where I know tons of super talented people that love to create and they want nothing to do with any of the other business. And they're willing to leave that all to somebody else mm -hmm. or not do it at all. Mm -hmm. And that's why nobody's hearing their music. Well, we'll have to put a pin in it and say that that's episode one. Um, I'm going to ask you even more daring questions our next time around. So put your seatbelts on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> but I, I certainly appreciate the time that you gave us today, Russ. I really am grateful for our friendship and I'm, I'm grateful for, you know, what we're starting and uh, what we'll be embarking on even in other platforms. We didn't talk this time about artist impact, but uh, by the time- I was that, gonna bring that up. Yeah, well, you know, uh, by the time this episode airs, uh, Artist Impact will already have launched and uh, grateful for you helping to launch that and making history with that being a template for, I think is what's gonna be a very, very dynamic TV show. We won't go into it now because we're out of time, but you, Russ, have really made an impact on me personally and on the Entree Musician community. Can't wait to start hearing your uh, podcast and the things that you're gonna discuss. I, I know you're just gonna open us up to a whole new world, man. So thank you, thank you, thank you, brother. Thank you, I appreciate it, Jerry. I appreciate you. And I appreciate being a part of this community. I, I think that community is is a good way to do some of these things that we're, we talked about today, which is help people get noticed, help people feel like what they're doing is worthwhile. That's right. And that, you know, creating the audience to hear it. Artist right. impact is a great is a great example, and I can't wait till people find out about that. Absolutely. Well, maybe you might want to do an episode on it yourself. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Okay. We'll see. <laughs>
<laughs> oh, well, thank you so much for joining us. This is Russ Palladino. You want to check out his website. I'm going to make sure that I have his contact information in the show notes. Uh, if you want to hear some great, fabulous, wonderful music, a person who's playing with heart, compositions that really reach out and grab you, you want to pay attention to Russ Palladino. He's a great friend, but uh, you're going to feel his friendly spirit when you hear his saxophone. No doubt. Oh, and his <laughs> flute as well. I can tell you, my brother <laughs> plays a mean flute too. So, <laughs> God Thank bless. You, Jared. Thank you. That's Appreciate it. I, I'll know I made it someday when I get to play on something together with you because you are an outstanding musician oh, and no. composer. No, we I mean, just really. do our parts, man. This is not the uh, mutual admiration ending right here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> well, peace and blessings to you, my brother and my friend. Take care. Uh, look for the show notes, everybody. Russ Palladino. And I am so grateful to be able to offer these wonderful conversations with so many incredible people. Russ being one of them. Thank you so much for joining. You are important. Go do your thing. All right? My name is Jerry B., I am the entree musician, but here's what's most vital for you to understand. So are you. We'll see you next time.